So welcome everyone and thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, welcome to our panel discussion uh, on the critical role of localization in protecting children. Um, today we gather to delve into a topic of profound importance, how localized efforts can transform child protection strategies in humanitarian and conflict settings across the globe. Today's panel is organized by the Localization Advisory Group in the Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action. You may find the link to the group's webpage in the chat. Despite the agreement on the importance of uh, this concept, the linkage between localization and child protection is not always adequately acknowledged or leveraged in planning and uh, implementation. This oversight can result in uh, uh, interventions that are less effective and do not resonate with the community's cultural and uh, contextual realities. As we explore this theme, we will uh, examine uh, diverse cases uh, from both Syria and Colombia, uh, each highlight the success and challenges of integrating local perspectives into broader child protection uh, frameworks. These cases uh, exemplify how uh, empowering local organizations and communities not only enhances the effectiveness and uh, inter, uh, interventions, but also ensures they are uh, culturally relevant and sustainable. Our esteemed uh, panelists who uh, have been directly involved in these uh, interventions will share their uh, individual insights and experiences. They will help us uh, understand the importance of localization from gaining local trust and building uh, capacities to navigating the complexities of international support and partnership. Uh, um, today's discussion is not just about presenting what has been done, it is about inspiring what can be done in the future. It is about learning from each other and building on localized strategies that uh, respect and utilize uh, the strength uh, in communities affected by crisis. Thanks for joining us for this critical conversation. Uh, your participation uh, uh, underscores the collective commitment and uh, uh, protecting our most vulnerable, the children. Joining me today for this important discussion, we have three esteemed panelists, uh, two uh, joining us from Colombia and one joining us from Turkey, but working uh, on the Syrian crisis. Firstly, we have uh, Helda, uh, Pemolano Assets, uh, the coordinator of the technical secretariat uh, of the uh, uh, coalition against the recruitment of children and youth into the armed uh, uh, conflict in Colombia, uh, Coaleco. Uh, she holds a law degree um, and has pursued master's studies in human rights. She's currently the commissioner for children and adolescents um sector of the Adv uh, advisory commission on human rights and peace a, a consultative uh, body created uh, by the final agreement between the colombian government and the former farc ep uh, especially for the national action plan on human rights and public policies in the field a warm welcome uh, secondly, we have Karam Al Amir, uh, who is uh, an activist in the human uh, humanitarian uh, field of education and child protection, working with uh, child guardians known as Haras since 2015. He holds a bachelor's degree uh, in business administration and later pursued to work and gain a master's degree in education in emergencies. He is currently part of the programs team. Uh, overseeing the uh, implementation of projects and designing the uh, response to children being affected by the ongoing crisis in Syria. 
And last year, he became an active member of work of different working groups uh, with the uh, with INI and the Child Protection Global Alliance. And last but not least, uh, we also have uh, Maria Carolina uh, um, Bertomo, the director of um, Childhood and Development Corporation in Colombia. She has a degree in psychology and. Uh, um, and is a specialist in social management. Uh, Maria Carolina has 21 years of experience developing social projects with vulnerable uh, population and in the context of armed conflict. A warm welcome everyone. Um, and uh, this is something that I have, uh, I, I should have done uh, from the start. Uh, my name is Riyad, and uh, I am um, the um, executive director of Child Guardians, known as Harass Network, and um, the co-lead of the international uh, of the uh, Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action. And I will be uh, your host today and try to moderate this uh, very interesting uh, discussion. Um, uh, again, a uh, very warm welcome for our esteemed panelists. Uh, we will start the panel very shortly. And after the panel discussion, we will be joined also uh, uh, from Tasha Gill, uh, who is the Senior Advisor for Child Protection and Emergencies and, uh, in UNICEF and the uh, co-lead for the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action. And also we will uh, be joined with um, uh, Eshing uh, um, Kokonia, who is the membership engagement lead uh, in the Alliance. Um, today, you will have the chance to uh, engage with us through the questions functionality uh, in Zoom. So feel free to interact with us uh, throughout the session. And without any further ado, I will uh, hand it over to Helda for her opening remarks um, and uh, over to you, Helda. Thank you very much, Richard. I'm part of the coalition against the recruitment of children and teenagers that are victims of the armed conflict in Colombia. This is called Coalico. It is a pleasure for me to share with you and with all the people that are with us today, certain reflections about our experience in the Colombian case. In this sense, I want to say that Coelico is a platform of different organizations coming from the civil society that during the last 25 years have worked in order to make visible the different impacts of the armed conflict in children and young people that have seen, have been affected in their lives because of this conflict, especially because of the, the link uh, to the armed groups. Since then, we have worked in order to have uh, recognition within the country's agenda of this situation, so that there, are, there is not a possibility in the different negotiations in the country to, to or that this, there is a possibility to stop the situation as, as soon as possible, because one of the main challenges that we have within the framework of protection of children is that children are growing up every day, of course. So that's where we need to tackle the situation as soon as possible in order to be able to uh, give better conditions to protect children that are being affected by this situation. And we want to share as well a last experience that we have we have had regarding the, the possibility to make this visible, the situation that are affecting uh, children, the recruitment of children by the armed conflict, for example. This were, we are based on the Red Hand Day that took place on the 12th of February. And we had the opportunity to have different voices and we created an articulated kind of work kind of work between different entities come from the government in Colombia, CSOs, different platforms coming from different levels that work in the country in order to protect children in different areas as well, and also including the armed conflict. We had the opportunity to work with different uh, international bodies that are also present in our countries in order to give better 
at the conditions for these populations and also international cooperation. This was an exercise that made it possible to make it visible, make this uh, current situation visible everywhere in Colombia, and especially the situation of uh, recruiting children in the armed uh, groups and armed conflicts. So being able to be in to be in the negotiation tables with the armed conflict, that was our stake. And we wanted to have as many voices as possible and to have the possibility as well to tackle the situation and to try to have uh, these children free, to have their freedom released from the situation and also to stop the situations in the future. We will be there every time that we have the opportunity. And as I said, it is a pleasure to share with you this experience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Helda. Uh, we all look forward to uh, discussing uh, this case more. I think it, uh, uh, it's like a very um, complex and sensitive case, uh, especially when you have like uh, children associated with armed groups. Um, uh, from Colombia, let me uh, turn to uh, the Syrian crisis. Um, to Karam, if you can please also uh, share with us maybe some information about the case and your opening remarks. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Riyadh. I hope uh, first my voice is clear. Uh, your voice is, is clear, but I cannot see your video. I don't know um, if it's only for me or it's a problem from your side. Um, I just tried to turn on my my video as well. Um, okay. Is it working now? I. Um, it doesn't work, but I'm not sure if it's only for me. Uh, can you mm. confirm if you can see Karam's? No, unfortunately, video? we can't see you, Karim. Karim, but um, maybe. Screen is black. Uh, because I am accepting the message about uh, to use the video, uh, but mm. I don't know why I'm not give appearing. Me, uh, give me one second, Karim. Sorry. Okay. Here we can go. You see Amazing. You now I can see you. Yes. Amazing. Thank you. Good, good. Go ahead. All right. Apologies for this inconvenience. Uh, first, thank you so much, Riyadh, for the introduction and for having us as local people to highlight our experiences of localization in our contexts. Uh, actually, it has always been emotionally tough uh, for me how I may express and speak about the shocking moments and experience that the Syrian population had witnessed and lived with uh, through and after the devastating earthquake that struck uh, southern Turkey and northern Syria in February last year. That has uh, unfortunately exacerbated the prolonged humanitarian crisis in Northwest Syria that has started in 2011. Uh, and this uh, new crisis, new emergency of, of earthquake was also characterized by high death toll and injuries, widespread destruction of uh, overcrowded houses and destruction of an already poor infrastructure in Northwest Syria. Although being directly affected by this crisis, my colleagues and myself in Child Guardians had the mandate to mitigate the impact of this crisis and ensure the survival, well-being, and protection of affected children and their families with the ultimate outcome to restore a sense of normalcy, resilience, and stability to the affected communities and to ensure that the needs of the most vulnerable children are met in a sustained and effective manner and this was derived from our theory of change that, that originally focused on ensuring uh, the affected children uh, to be safe, well, and educated, since uh, we all know these are uh, uh, of, of basic child rights. Our experience is characterized by our motivation of planning to serve the affected people, proudly saying that most of my colleagues, including myself, could manage to resume uh, our work and start uh, to take part in the emergency response planning whenever we were still in shelters or, for example, in vehicles while moving to other uh, cities, uh, seeking safer places for, for ourselves and, and our families as well. 
with unfortunate uh, no noticeable uh, absence from from INGOs response which proved that the local people are uh, and should always be the first to respond and support in child guardians since the establishment back in 2012 we hold and believe in in different values not only related to child protection as originally provided through the CPMS and other sources uh, such as the best interest of the children, uh, they do no harm. Uh, we also believe that the significant role of local communities in shaping, deciding, and in many cases, implementing the response itself, specifically when it comes to emergencies like the earthquake. Therefore, we started to adapt community-based approach integrated in our response uh, through child protection local committees in schools we support and in communities we reach out to. Uh, I will be ready to provide uh, more details uh, in, in the plant section uh, today. Thank you so much. Many thanks, Karan. Um, uh, I think the uh, uh, the case in Syria, like um, like especially after the earthquake, adds to the complexity of uh, the ongoing conflict, and it would be like uh, very interesting to see how uh, you did leverage the uh, the local capacities to um, to overcome uh, those uh, um, uh, new complexities um from here let me uh, turn back to to colombia and give the floor um, for you uh, maria carolina please go ahead hola muy buenos días para todos para... good morning everybody as it was mentioned, we, the uh, Childhood and Development uh, Corporation, this is a local organization that uh, works nationally in Colombia, and its mission is to accompany and transform the different environments that are affecting the children that are within the armed conflict that being, are being recruited as well and that are being used and victims uh, by different kinds of violences that we see in our country. As a local organization, in order to give response to these situations of recruitment, use and violence, we had to create, um, since different um, perspectives, uh, many times we were the first people to respond to this crisis and we had to as I said, create different actions and that are coordination actions with other organizations from the humanitarian actions. And as a local organization, this has allowed us to make it visible, make visible the, the situation of children and also to coordinate ourselves with different uh, agencies from the UN and also other international bodies. And protecting children requires today to have an articulated kind of work and a, co a coordination and we need to take into account the different contexts where the children are and the capabilities and uh, abilities that the children uh, that these places have in order to give responses without cr generating actions that are going to damage them or uh, actions that are just there to help to assist and that just um, respond or answer a certain situation but if we think about uh, different links, maybe we need to create different processes in order to make the crisis more stable and to, uh, to overcome the situation in a more sustainable way and sustained way. So in this moment, uh, through this coordination articulation with the different species, we were able to lead the humanitarian team in a local way. And that's why it was possible that many local organizations were able to, to participate in these spaces. And in the humanitarian architecture of our country, we are co-leading the childhood protection table where we articulate different response actions with the Colombian states and with the different organizations taking into account the different needs that children have. And also we are trying to boost the, internet, the the response that is led by the community. It is a very important kind of work by which we accompany, we give response so that the different organizations can 
he, uh, with the processes, can create um, feasible actions, but also uh, to make sure that these actions are in the communities. They are the main people here. I think that Colombia has a very important situation regarding the protection of childhood. We need to create and continue creating these responses. And I think we are in the right path in order to continue building in these responses to give this capability for the communities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. Um, I think it's like also a very interesting uh, angle to look at localization from the perspective of coordination, especially when you have like local uh, actors and international actors um, uh, uh, working on the field. Um, if maybe uh, if maybe now I can uh, open the uh, the the discussion and uh, maybe turn back to uh, uh, Hilda uh, with my first question. Um, Hilda, your case uh, or Koaliko's case uh, um, involved significant local advocacy uh, to bring the issue of child uh, uh, ex component uh, to the uh, um, peace negotiation table. Can you describe how local actors and organizations like Koaliko uh, leveraged the local knowledge and the networks to um, influence these high level discussions? Maybe if you can highlight uh, um, what does this uh, say about the power and necessity of uh, local uh, um, involvement in shaping uh, outcomes in international peace processes. Muchísimas gracias, Riyad. Sí, efectivamente, en en esta experiencia de lo local. It's correct to see, it's correct to say that this experience, this local experience, has been very important as an expression of civil society. And within the national organizations, we can accumulate the experience and we can get the right position for girls and boys that have been affected by the armed conflict, especially within the field of recruitment and usage by the armed groups. This is a problem in our country, the armed conflict. It's been going on for more than 60 years. And in the last few decades has showed different possibility. And we have had different negotiations and talks with the actors. And one of the subjects that has come up and the one that is very difficult within the negotiation has been everything that refers to these children that are involved with the armed forces. This is difficult within the negotiation. It's difficult for the country to face them uh, because we got children that have been recruited by that armed groups. We have a problem of positioning. There are many political interests involved and uh, how to weaken the actor or alter the negotiation process. This is a very complex and delicate subject. And in the center of the discussion, it's not just the freedom uh, of the children, but we want to know how this is going to influence the negotiations and the processes in general. Therefore, we have to think how we can face these uh, subjects, especially taking into account that we have uh, such a difficulties uh, to face within the children. We have to use our experience, find the best ways to influence the actions favoring childhood and and shall, as I said, we have a special celebration, the World Day of Red Hands, Manos Rojas. This allowed us to complement our work with the local work that is done day by day. We have different groups of actors in our territories 
we have always been identified and we do know that all of them are affecting girls and boys. And when we see this polarization, we want to find the best way to deal with this. We are aware of the situation. We know the situation and we establish a follow up and we got different sources that give us uh, knowledge of what's going on. We take into account all the elements. Uh, so we realize that the subject is not only regarding the childhood, but it's also regarding polarization. And we want to acknowledge these difficulties. We know the behaviors of the armed groups are complex, and we know what this uh, implies for the political structures. To acknowledge that they are recruiting children within a conflict makes things difficult for them. And we have to also be aware of who is our population, our central population. We want our actions to reach the actors, to reach those that take decisions, to reach those that negotiate the conflict and the finalization of the contracts. We want to make sure that the community is prepared eventually to receive those children that are going to leave the armed groups. And finally, we want to actually make sure they leave these groups. That, but uh, this is a big challenge. But our final idea is prevention, to avoid those children going into the groups. This is important. We want actions that will reconsider those that are most at risk. Really, they are the young teenagers that are at high risk. Uh, but even those in childhood are living with the conflict and they are therefore at risk. Through the exercise of localization, we realize the important work that we have to do in order to make sure these situations are acknowledged by the communities. We have to accept in our country the recruitment. This is part of our usual situation. And it is important that the communities understand this as a violation of the rights of the children. This has been a difficult point. And they, as, as local actors, we have to have a dialogue about this. We have to prepare the territories and we have to uh, take the right measures to avoid these situations and their continuity. And we have to be ready within the communities to protect the children, to avoid in a, the problem, and also to be prepared to receive these children, which will be essential within a process of social inclusion. And this is all at the moment, and we can go on with a dialogue at the later stage. Thank you very, very much, Helga. This was very powerful and uh, and very, very important aspects that uh, you have raised. I think the the highlight for me was that like there is always an a, like a goal under the end goal that we can see if we don't understand the context, like uh, you said, it's not only about freeing the children, but you wanna understand and see how this will affect the, the peace process itself. And you stressed also on the role of the community when it comes to uh, uh, working with those children, receiving them and uh, ensure the sustainability um, of uh, uh, the actions uh, uh, and efforts that you have uh, already done. So thank you very, very much for uh, this uh, very powerful uh, intervention. If I can maybe from here also turn back to, to Karam um, and uh, ask you, um, Karam, 
in in your case study, uh, you've mentioned the formation of a local child protection committee, uh, um, and uh, like relying on the communities uh, themselves. Um, uh, you had like uh, child headmasters, uh, sorry, school headmasters, and uh, child protection focal points from schools uh, and uh, uh, parents uh, from the communities. Um, can you maybe elaborate more on how the local leadership and the active uh, community involvement uh, shape the response uh, strategy for the earthquake? and how uh, or what challenges were overcome to integrate uh, these local voices effectively into the decision making process especially when it's like a very uh, uh, like fast crisis you need to save lives you need to respond to to people who are displaced uh, so how did you work on that and being a local actor how did that benefit you yeah thank you so much Riyad. Uh, maybe I would first uh, to start like uh, quickly for a few moment, uh, moments with our definition of, of localization in child guardians, which we see as a way of rethinking the humanitarian sector from the ground up, recognizing that most of the humanitarian assistance is already provided by local actors. It also means for us shifting from a subcontracting to a partnership approach investing in a sustainable way in a strong fundamental organizational core of local organizations. Examples of these finance and oversight mechanisms, leadership and institutional identity and purpose, rather than focusing narrowly on response capacities. Further, localization ensures that international humanitarian coordination mechanisms are welcoming, contextual and relevant to local humanitarian actors. So for us, localization is a holistic approach aiming to increasing international investment and respect for the role of local actors with the goal of reducing costs and increasing the reach of humanitarian action. Now, back to our earthquake related response uh, in our case, our strategy was that to empower communities to be part of and conduct the response itself and that activities uh, with, with the proportion of at least 10% can be managed by these local committees, which uh, which consist of a school, uh, which are either in schools or in communities. As you mentioned, uh, PTA, the parent and teacher associations. In order to improve the community resilience and accountability to the affected population. Uh, and this was in the form of micro grants or initiatives to support disaster reduction and response school development plans or other initiatives to improve safety and accessibility in school and to support ongoing coordination between case management actors and multi-sectoral service providers with a particular focus on health and education sectors. Ensure other sectors are part of the referral pathway and they have the capacity to identify and refer children at risk safely and ethically. So the significant role these local people, these local committees actually played at both the strategic and implementation level happened through their engagement and collaboration since the early stages, contributing first to the needs assessment through surveys, focus group discussions and field observations uh, in the most affected areas with, with the children and families, as well as uh, they contributed to identifying uh, and prioritizing who uh, are setting the vulnerability criteria uh, to identify uh, who are the most affected and vulnerable children in these communities that we should prioritize in our protection response and in the distribution of protection kits, which included, I mean, this criteria finally included uh, uh, separated and unaccompanied children, children with, dis with disabilities, displaced children and parents. These committees had also the role to directly conduct initiatives to improve and rehabilitate the damaged child-friendly spaces and the schools in the most affected areas. The initiatives plans were initially prepared and proposed from their side, 
and then uh, they were approved and supported by child guardians through the response projects ongoing uh, at, at that time. And until uh, the time being, uh, child guardians, guardians is still supporting these community-based initiatives to, to rehabilitate the schools, reaching over 120 schools in Northwest Syria and child-friendly spaces, of course, in different areas affected by the earthquake. Now, when it comes to defining the barriers our NGO managed to work with uh, during our response, and specifically related to localization in emergencies, is whenever we think uh, or whenever we don't have actually the enough resources uh, in our response to include everyone from, from, uh, fr from the fund that we have, we actually cannot depend on securing these resources from the communities since they are already affected. And so uh, they are not able to contribute, uh, I mean, with, with things uh, further than their efforts. Uh, hence, what we did was to, cont to continue to observe and report about these needs and attempting to address uh, and seek through uh, seek th uh, more funds through our projects and partners. Another key point or, or a barrier was that uh, we, we usually, we know that we usually lack the existence of a strong local coordination, which is required, uh, I mean, all the time, but uh, specifically in, in such emergency situations, uh, through which we, uh, we can ensure that everyone is included and the selection criteria to be unified, or at least cover the most vulnerable and affected according to the specific and individual needs of children and families. And here we also depended on our strong networks with, with our partners and with, with the uh, local committees in order to, uh, to establish and to continue our, our response as, as well. Uh, uh, this is all done from, from my side uh, regarding this, uh, your, your question, Riyadh. I will be ready um, to answer any questions in this regard. Thank you, over from my side. Thank you very, very much, Karam. And uh, again, it's like a really uh, powerful and in, in important uh, intervention. I think um, uh, this also like give us the 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 sense that localization is it doesn't end with the local NGOs, but it goes beyond local NGOs to local communities. And uh, as you mentioned in your opening remarks, like uh, you, you were based in, in um, Southern Turkey where it was hit the most. And uh, most of you, you were like working uh, from cars and uh, trying to evacuate uh, uh, the city. This is why working with the communities themselves uh, it's very important uh, where like an NGO, whether local or international, cannot implement the communities themselves, can, can take the initiative. And this really shows that uh, localization is not an end goal, but it is a mean to, uh, uh, to be able to implement in a sustainable and, uh, um, uh, um, and like, uh, um, collective uh, way that would benefit everyone on on the um, the field. Um, thank you very much for answering my question. And I turn uh, to um, Maria Carolina. Um, and my question to you um, is that uh, the case uh, that you talked about highlights the uh, development of community-driven methodologies that uh, uh, in, empowered local communities to identify and uh, mitigate risks uh, to children. Um, how critical is this role for local organizations in uh, sustaining these initiatives? And what steps did uh, LACID uh, take to ensure that local capacities were built and maintained to continue these uh, child protection efforts uh, in uh, um, going forward. In order to reply to your question, I would like to tell you about the humanitarian response uh, from the community. Localization doesn't only end 
when the organization has some humanitarian actions. It is only the beginning of the uh, different options, and we must reach the communities. The humanitarian response in, is in the community is a methodology when we do a diagnosis of the needs of the children within the subjects of protection. And we have to start generating different projects or ideas for projects uh, answering these situations of risk. That's how the humanitarian responses started, together with experts that were generating different actions, practical actions, in order to obtain the results that are expected for the children in Potomayo, in Colombia, in Puerto Leguizamo, we were able to develop some 20 experiences of responses by the community. But I want to mention a particular case. In this area, unfortunately, we have armed groups. We have a lot of risk due to conflict and they are using girls, boys, and teenagers in the territory. The community was aware of the situation, and in this municipality, uh, which is a rural municipality, um, uh, it's quite uh, difficult to access the area. It's difficult to go in the territory, it's difficult to get out of the territory. And the community that has really the knowledge of the territory they created an ambulance, like a mobile uh, transport that can be used for these children that are at risk of being recruited, or if they have any health problem, they can be moved with this ambulance uh, away from the municipality in order to save their lives. This is a very important experience, and this puts into evidence the validity of the local network and the value of their local knowledge, because allows these communities, organizations on the communities, a response. We, they can have uh, local actions referring to these children and their safety. And through this sample, you also ask, you ask about the sustainability. The, we are facing quite a lot of challenges. We have to take into account the length of the projects, where they are short, medium, or long term. Uh, sometimes in emergencies, you need a very quick response. And when you are saving lives, maybe, and you have to go forward with the medium term and long term actions too in times of crisis. And we also need, in order to achieve sustainability, we need flexibility from our donors because we may need changes in our responses. Therefore, it's very important to realize that the context can vary and that we taking into account the local knowledge in order to take the proper actions and help the development of the communities. One has to produce associations uh, uh, we have to have, uh, we have to know what the community feels for these actions to be sustainable. We have to offer the protection of the childhood in spite of the context that we are facing. And what do we do to support this long term? This is all based in the knowledge. We acknowledge it. We do a diagnosis 
of the context and we provide uh, training with capacitation and therefore we allow for different actions to take place at once to especially those that are going to have a larger impact those communities as it was said over many many decades these communities have lived together with the armed forces we want to give them uh, acknowledge their capacity so they can support the situation long term we want to go on working from the working together to make sure too that the different international organizations acknowledge the local knowledge and we can go on working together on coordinate coordination spaces from the humanitarian point of view and the communities will be the support for the development of all these and the international uh, organizations will be there for participating in the response to the protection of the childhood. This is what we do facing different methodologies within our territory. Thank you very much, uh, Maria Carolina. Uh, I think uh, we can all agree that, uh, as you said, like we, we don't have all the answers. We need to uh, rely on local knowledge, which we need to consult. We need to uh, um, involve those entities uh, um, and coordination here uh, is key and is something that we, we need to focus on. Uh, whenever we, we're doing a uh, humanitarian response and uh, localization uh, basically uh, is the answer to uh, um, allow for those goals or means to, to, to take place. Um, I would like to, to thank you very much for for uh, um, giving all the amazing work uh, you have been doing. Um, we might, if the time uh, allows, come back to you with more questions. But uh, um, before I open the floor for, uh, uh, for questions, um, I want just to um, maybe highlight some of the key messages that we have heard uh, uh, from you. Uh, first, the community engagement and ownership is is key uh, this is something that we need to to focus on it goes beyond uh, the uh, local or national NGOs it goes to the community itself um, local leadership especially in decision making uh, whether it's a uh, um, a long-term conflict or like a, uh, a natural disaster is also a, a key um the inclusion of uh, uh, children rights uh, um, in a localized way hearing the, the voice of of, uh, of the victims and the, the affected that relation is key uh, whether it is a humanitarian response or like a peace process um, um and also uh, the local knowledge um uh, as a resource uh, for effective interventions is is key. We need to build on on local knowledge and uh, empower the local communities uh, um, to to take actions through consultations, coordinations, or even uh, um, capacity building. Um, I would thank you. I'd like to thank you again for uh, all of your amazing work and interventions. Um, and now I would like to open the floor for any questions or comments uh, from uh, uh, the the uh, the audience. Um, so feel free to to 
start using the Q&A functionality. So Riyadh, it looks like there is one question or couple, two questions in one and one submission in the Q and A, and then we also have one question that's just been asked in the in the chat. So I don't know if you want to start with those two, and then we can see if yes. more come in. Yeah. Sure. So uh, first question is: What more can the international community, um, including donors, uh, but also UN agencies and INGOs, do? to take effective steps toward ensuring that localization localized child protection efforts become a normal in the uh, become the normal in the future of humanitarian assistance um so here the question is about the role of uh, the international communities whether they are um donors, uh, UN agencies, and uh, uh, or um, INGOs. Um, so um, I, I don't want to put anyone on, uh, on the spot. Uh, if uh, Hilda, Maria, Carolina, or Karam would, would like to, to answer uh, this question, uh, please um, feel free to, to unmute yourself. Uh, I think uh, yeah, would you like to go, uh, Hilda? Thank you. We are going to find a very important role for the international community here, especially the donors and the different UN agencies. It is very important to believe in the different local capabilities. There's not only the, the, it is not only because of, of their experience of the situation, but because they have an experience that to respond to the different emergency situations of conflict situations. In the case of Colombia, for example, it wasn't easy to uh, create some capacity building locally for the social inclusion processes and the restitution of rights as well. But the, having the opportunity to talk to the communities, for example, in the case of the department that is very visible today, because it has the highest number of recruitments. This is the department called AUPA, and it has a, a mostly indigenous peoples and Afro-descendant peoples. And we were able to see the different responses that the communities are creating together with their own authorities, we saw that this can be a very important alternative in order to face these situations. So uh, thinking about the experience of the communities, the fact that they are in the different territories, the fact that they have certain capacities that can be highlighted, and what's important there as well is the recognition, to be able to um, trust these initiatives. This is very important. It is important to also have certain local spaces and also this should have a relevance or a visibility that is required and this also helps them and helps these local initiatives to be distributed or communicated in other areas in a country that has a conflict such as the one that we are in colombia thank you very much thank you very much uh, held i think the um this is like a very uh, comprehensive answer. And maybe the second part of the question can be uh, directed to you, uh, Maria Carolina, as you have spoken about the, the local capacities. So the question, could you provide uh, practical examples of uh, what, uh, what could help local actors lead on humanitarian CB responses in the future? I think there are three different perspectives here. We need that the local organizations, that is to say us, we need to be the main people here. We have these three different perspectives, as I said. First, integration perspective. And we need to be within this humanitarian architecture as well. So this perspective in this one, it is important to recognize the different plans, projects, actions that are being created from the communities and that are giving something to these humanitarian actions. 
Another perspective is a communitarian perspective. The different actors need to join this in order to adjust the response to their communities and not the other way around. So not just getting there with a project and certain programs, certain actions that are not contextualized and that are generating actions that are damaging and that are not sustainable in their communities and organizations. And also a holistic approach and comprehensive approach. In, we need as local organizations, we need this in order to, to have a role in the humanitarian architecture. We need to strengthen certain technical capabilities and decision-making capabilities as well. We need to have a system to manage the quality so that we can, for example, in the case of safety, logistics, politics, institutional politics, we need to have or we would be able to have the tools that are necessary and the processes and procedures that are necessary for carrying out this work and also financing. We need to have resources that can be used in order to qualify the different organizations. If the resources that are received for the administration for yeah, I think administration, if these resources need to be reused in the project, the different capabilities of the local organizations are going to be reduced because we're always going to have to look for other resources in order to, to cover certain aspects that are not included in the projects. So if I needed to choose and to be in a coordination space or to generate a project that are going to be to give them the possibility to, to live in the long term, of course, I'm going to um, choose one or the other. So we need to uh, think about a proper financing. And also, we need to have certain associations or collaborations with international organizations and with the UN agencies. The answer, uh, minding the time, uh, I will like uh, maybe direct one last question to Karam. Uh, or maybe uh, two questions together. Uh, so the first one, we would like to um, hear more about the micro grants to communities. And maybe you have uh, read the, the question on the chat. There are like a uh, number of challenges that we face usually when we work on micro grants. So maybe if, we, if you can shed the light on that. And maybe while you are answering, you can also uh, um, tap to uh, the, the question also regarding the sustainability because i think this is like you've mentioned that in your intervention that like counting on the communities like ensure sustainability so the question is how can we bring community-based uh, structures to ensure um, uh, the sustainability of activities because after the project uh, uh, finish most of the uh, time after ngos leave uh, the activities fall down so if you can maybe shed the light on, on those two questions. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Uh, and for uh, uh, raising these two questions. Um, actually, uh, let's let's start to, um, I would start to confess uh, that it's really challenging. It has never been easy for us to, uh, whenever we first started to, uh, to include the component of micro grants. And here, let's uh, maybe kind of differentiating between the micro grants itself and uh, and the initiatives, because uh, in times of emergencies, uh, maybe it's it's uh, much harder to uh, to think of uh, or to to include uh, the specific component of uh, uh, of micro grants because it requires I mean a lot of I mean much more efforts related to maybe vetting processes and I mean it's it's I mean it's something related to. To, to the donor requirements and I mean what the project agreement is about uh, and we 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 actually did this uh, but I mean not not actually in emergency situation but in the crisis in in the situation of Northwest Syria uh, back in we started with in in the context of schools in 2019 as I remember uh, going forward with the capacity building of these people I mean the co the committees in the schools uh, to ensure that they are able to uh, to use, I mean, these grants, uh, how how they are how they are planning 
uh, to use, I mean, the, the fund and uh, I mean, to implement and document and do everything. But in regard to our uh, specific case or specific context uh, in the earthquake response, we actually focused more on the initiative itself because um, we tried here more to 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 focus that uh, on on the on the sense of of ownership that local committees and communities uh, are able uh, to plan uh, take part in the planning and and the implementation and also uh, the finalization and I mean closure of of the uh, the initiative itself and the role of our team our NGO was uh, was mainly to uh, I mean to support like in terms of technically and also to be uh, be, be part of these committees I mean members in these committees as well uh, while these initiatives are I mean kind of in the plan in the planning process in the implementation and the documentation in order to ensure everything is I mean kind of uh, going well and properly as a planned and as as I mean it goes with the project requirements and the donor requirements and uh, those stuff so uh, our our experience is actually uh, limited or specific specific to, uh, to the education sector on the reha rehab rehabilitation of the schools uh, that are um, that were I mean previously uh, either I mean slightly damaged or I mean moderately and on different damages through the uh, due to the earthquake uh, so we took part uh, in this uh, I mean in supporting these initiatives and uh, we we continued I mean till uh, the, the the time being um, I hope if uh, I mean if that's I mean uh, I mean all good to cover the the first question, uh, maybe regarding the sustainability uh, factor, it's it's I mean actually I mean always challenging for us and for for all other I mean actors and NGOs in the field. Uh, whenever we we do have I mean this concern and I usually have the challenge how how to write about the sustainability starting from the project proposal I mean uh, stage. Because uh, this is, I mean, not, not only uh, not an easy process, but uh, it's, it's, I mean, related to the long, I mean, uh, th that we can do on the long run. Uh, but we have, I mean, one little experience about, uh, I would like to share about, uh, about the sustainability, which I mean, is, is not actually uh, related or, uh, I mean, uh, specifically to the earthquake response. But our organization had um, also uh, to uh, had had a response. Uh, I mean, in schools integ integrated into schools with ECD uh, activities, early childhood development. Uh, that uh, the project was specifically, uh, I mean, really simple about providing. I mean, very simple materials in order to to show the the schools or the communities that that you are able uh, whenever you have the capacity, the technical capacity. How how you do this? So you can you can lean on I mean local resources I mean from from your communities in order to to sustain the activity even if our project ends or I mean uh, after our project ends. But uh, of course I mean to, to be to be honest about this maybe uh, this is not uh, maybe it's it's I mean hard to say that this is applicable uh, I mean across all the other activities. Especially uh, whenever um, I mean speaking speaking of the uh, protection uh, humanitarian protection assistance, because in in in, in emergency situation we focus on the ur the urgent I mean needs of children and families, and we do this through different activities through the case management and other interventions. So um, it's I mean it's hard again uh, to think of the sustainability factor, but I believe. Uh, whenever the local uh, people, the local communities have the capacity to do it, so and and they have this sense of ownership. So um, I I mean th this is from from my little or simple experience. They they can I mean uh, so they can seek solutions how how to uh, how to sustain it uh, even I mean with the activities I mean or the project uh, is not is not there or I mean does not continue. Thank you so much. That's over from my side. Thank you very, very much, Kalam. Uh, this is very comprehensive, and I think it links also to what uh, Maria Carolina was also saying regarding the, the community initiatives and how uh, uh, they can also like work together to, to provide solutions. Um, I would like us like just like in the sake of time, we will have like another like uh, seven to eight minutes uh, to uh, to answer more questions at the end of the session. But now I would like to turn to uh, Tasha. Are you with us? 
A hundred percent. Amazing. Welcome, Tasha. Um, it's always nice to to speak to you. Um, my maybe I would like uh, for you to like since you co lead the international uh, the uh, alliance for child protection and humanitarian action. And I know recently we uh, in the Alliance have done some uh, uh, structural changes in the Alliance in favor of uh, uh, localization. We wanted to change this very big body that has lots of actors, uh, local actors, INGOs, UN agencies, in order to mainstream localization into our um, uh, um, uh, structure. And it proves that no matter how complex you are, you can do it. Uh, and there is a way to do it. So can you maybe walk us through what you have done in the Alliance and why is it important for a body that produces uh, uh, guidance and, uh, and uh, technical notes uh, to, to uh, have localization as a main pillar in it? Great, thank you so much. Um... First of all, I am delighted to be here. So thank you for the invitation. Um, I've been following the discussions and the examples um, very closely and just want to appreciate uh, the organization of this session and all of the, the speakers who've taken the time and reflection to share. Um, it's been a great session, so thanks, Riyad. Um, and so I'm happy to share a little bit, um, as you asked, about um, what we've tried to do inside the Alliance. Um, and I was thinking about that as I heard some of the examples, whether it's the programming, the coordination piece from across the panelists um, and how that reflects um, and I think also drives what we've been trying to do in the Alliance. So I know I only have a few minutes, I'll speak briefly to it um, and then look forward to continuing the, the discussion um, for this session. Um, so when I was thinking about this after you asked me, I was I was thinking about words to action. Um, and I know we often say that, but I feel strongly that that's what we've tried to do at the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action, um, which is, as you said, a large network, but not a very old one. Um, we're only a few years old in the span of things, um, and yet we have a very ambitious agenda around this issue of localization, as well as the centrality of children and their protection, which is our core mandate um, and what we're striving for. And they're intertwined. To be effective in our mandate, this is a key priority. Um, and we made that clear um, as an entire network when we developed our 20. 21 to 2025 strategy. So within that strategy, there's a key priority on localization. And I think it's important to say a couple of things about that. First is the process of developing the strategy was also a very wide consultative process. Hundreds of child protection practitioners um, and, and policy people and government um, members but also frontline practitioners fed into the alliance, said what they, into the strategy, said what they thought would be important. And there was um, a winnowing down, a, a decision making process that we all had to take together about, so what are going to be the key priorities we're going to go for? And this is one of them. And so I do want, I, I wanna read that priority because I think it's important. Um, the child protection sector transforms its way of working, I love that word, transforms its way of working rooted in the sharing of capacity, expertise, opportunity, and the intentional shift of power and resources to community, local, and national actors. So all of those words are really important. Um, and so then that's the question, right? Words to action. So how do we take this forward? Um, and part of those commitments were about, you know, the availability, accessibility, diversity of the products the Alliance puts out, those technical notes, as you said, the programmatic guidance, the examples of what works, what we've learned, what is effective, a lot of the questions and discussions from the panel today, um, so that all of these products can reach a, a broad and diverse audience. And then another part of it is about the way in which we um, expand opportunities for leadership and influence. And that's really what you're asking me to speak about. And just very quickly, I wanna highlight 
the process that um, we undertook as a governance body for the Alliance. So we did a governance review, essentially an independent expert came in and looked at the way that we organize ourselves and other organizations and networks um, in order to come up with some recommendations on the way forward. And there was a specific question on this issue of localization. So that was in 2021, so that it could be aligned with the strategy that I mentioned earlier. Um, and the steering committee of the Alliance went through those recommendations. A small team came together. Um, you and I were part of that. Um, which was great working together to then determine, okay, how do we take these recommendations forward? Um, and what's important to highlight around this piece is that in the, the bodies that lead the Alliance that are basically accountable to all of the network members to make sure that we uphold and deliver on these priorities, um, we took a number of decisions. So there were co-lead agencies a steering committee that was leading the alliance um, and we've developed another structure as well so now there's these three structures co-lead agencies a steering committee and an executive committee and what's important to mention is that in all three of these structures there was a very explicit intentional commitment to bring in national organizations so there were only two co-lead agencies before there are now three um, and Riyadh, you are one of them, as you said in your intro. Um, I represent the uh, represent UNICEF as a co-lead agency, and World Vision International um, is the third co-lead. The commitment is that there will always be these three, national NGO, international NGO, and UN agency for the co-leads. The steering committee, which is responsible for really the, the strategic decision-making, um, there's 20 seats, and there's also commitment there. There should be representation from across our network. So representation from local or national NGOs, from international organizations, um, and from academic institutions. And so that means in being intentional about ensuring that there's rep representation in those 20 seats from all those organizations. And then we created an executive committee with five seats. Um, and here we have the three co-leads um, and two other seats, and we're very explicit in the language of our governance paper um, that says that, you know, that one of those member seats will be given preferentially to a national NGO. And so the point of that is we've been able to turn those words and our priority at the lofty goals into concrete actions. And I'm very pleased and proud of all of us working together to say that we have fulfilled those. Um, they are now operational um, and we are um, also um, getting the fruit of all of those efforts as well um, by um, leading the Alliance in a way that really reflects its membership. So a lot of learning there. I think um, a couple of things I just wanna say. One is that it's so important to me to come into this process with integrity <laughs> um, and really you know, the, the learning and the listening um, and that this is not about you know, adapting um, you know, one group in order to fit to another, but really adapting together in order to be able to be better together um, for our shared goal. And then the other one is how can we work together to always be set up for success, to be successful in reaching our goals um, by working together across different types of organizations with different roles, mandates, and experience that are absolutely vital. Um, so those are the key points I wanted to share. And thanks again for inviting me to join this conversation. Thank you very much, Tasha. Inspiring as always. Uh, you've mentioned that you like the word uh, transformation and the strategic goal. And I love the word intentional. So as you said, like we need to do this intentionally. We need to decide that we want, this is what we want and it's uh, very important and will shape the way we work and then do it. Um, maybe to hear more uh, about that, I will come back to you with the question, Tasha, but maybe before we need to uh, hear more about the strategy, about how can we contribute to this work also as uh, uh, CP practitioners or even like localization advocates. Uh, so uh, I would invite uh, Ashnin to uh, maybe come forward and maybe provide some information on, on, on this uh, topic. Uh, thank you very much, Riyadh, and the giants that have spoken before me. It's really difficult to speak after 
uh, people have spoken and have covered everything, but since I have the opportunity, I'll say a few words. Um, in addition to what Tasha has said, uh, the Alliance also formed a localization advisory committee and 50% of, and, and their role is to advise the Alliance on how to implement localization. 50% of those um, of the members of the advisory committee are national and local members, and they come from different countries, right from uh, Colombia to Syria, from Europe to Southern Africa, Malawi in particular. So um, yes, we have advisors that will help the Alliance chart the best way forward. Um, secondly, um, the Alliance also um, initiated, a, a, um, came up with an initiative to have champions in five countries from different parts of the world. And uh, some of those champions are on this call. Um, the role of the champions is to um, decentralize alliance and they are the focal points between the alliance and the other alliance members in their, in their community. And theirs is also to facilitate active participation of alliance members in their communities and then later on uh, then to the alliance. So some of them you later on see them taking leadership roles and other roles in the different spaces within the Alliance. And allow me to mention them. We have um, one member from South Sudan, uh, that's Chido. We have another one from Iraq, Rob from Nigeria. We have Rise to Inspire Africa Initiative. And uh, from Yemen, we have Abs Development Organization for Woman and Child. So, um, and then we are also working with Relon in Uganda to um, ensure that Alliance work, whatever we do is decentralized and we have focal points. If there's information that needs to get to the members, uh, we have the champions um, um, cascading that and the, the link between the Alliance and members in those uh, countries. Um, then in terms of way forward, what we have in place, um, I would like to talk about shortly, briefly, about how to become um, a, an Alliance member. We have an online um, uh, application form and my colleague uh, Kira will help me share the, the link. So we go to the website and uh, you click on how to become a member, you apply and we, advise, we, we would advise you to apply for general members. Once you apply for general membership, we will get your application, a member of the Alliance. And moving from that, uh, we will invite you to, thank you very much, Kira, for doing that. We'll invi invite you to a membership engagement workshop where you're going to be, um, we're going to share information about the Alliance, what it is, what it's not, the different spaces within which work is done. For example, working groups, task forces and initiative. You'll also hear about the different um, advisory groups like the localization advisory group. Uh, there's lots more. So once you get to hear where you can uh, engage, participate meaningfully, you then apply. Uh, to that particular working group or task force, you'd be um, admitted and then you take, um, you take it forward from that. So I take this opportunity to invite you to go to the website and the website is in the four main languages. Feel free to apply in Arabic, Spanish, French or English. We will process your application and then um, you'll take it forward from there. Okay, you will ask that after the workshop, then what, how do I engage? I already talked about the workshop itself. That's a beautiful engagement opportunity. Then we also have the working groups, task forces and initiative. We don't have time here to go into the details, but that's another place, these advisory groups. Um, then uh, champions, I've talked about champions and um, newsletters. You, uh, you can also forward your newsletters to the Alliance and then about the work you do and they 
your work will be featured within uh, our newsletter. Last but not least, um, the Alliance has members from all over the world, but there are other parts of the world that are not so well represented, for example, Latin America and the Caribbean. This uh, year we are having the annual meeting in, in Panama, in that particular region. So we're hoping that this is going to be another opportunity, a golden opportunity to reach out to members in that region. Another region that doesn't have many members is the Oceania region. We are working very hard to get um, members, uh, especially from disadvantaged communities in those uh, in those region. Um, Riyadh, I know we are pressed for time, but give me just two minutes to tell a story. Please, go ahead. <laughs> Shukran. Once upon a time, there was a humanitarian worker that went to a part of the world to, to work with an accompanied and separated children. Um, in that part of the world, in that country, there were four main refugee camps. And the way unaccompanied and separated children were being taken care of was in a uh, group setup. So uh, the children were organized in several groups and there was one or two adults taking care of them, but they were basically in groups. So this humanitarian worker got in and said, the, the humanitarian worker was expected to do that in another um, refugee camp. But she said, hmm, Let's try something else. Let's try kinship care. And the humanitarian system said, mm -mm, that will not work. Why? Because the refugees, um, all of them have the intention to go to Europe. So none of them want to stay here long enough. None of them want to take care of a child that is not on their, on, that's not their, theirs. So no, 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 kinship care will not work. And, and she said, wait, 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 wait. Okay, give me, a, give me a moment. Let me go to the community and find out what's happening. To cut a long story short, there were many, many separated children that were already in kinship care that the humanitarian system didn't know about. So what did the humanitarian workers do? They just confirmed what the community was already doing. So the unaccompanied children in that refugee camp were the ones that were uh, supported. They worked with the community to get foster care. So that is a, a long story in terms of the, the work of the community. Some of, sometimes we might not know what the community is doing, but the community is already shouldering a lot of that. Now, I have a question. Which country do you think that that was a community with four refugee camps um, and many of them were going to Europe. Boats were uh, capsizing, unfortunately, on their way to Italy. Take a guess in the chat. What country was that? Okay, there isn't. There is no answer. We will, I'll give you the answer to, in, the next, in the, next, the next time we meet. Shukran and namaste. We see you uh, another time. Thank you very, very much, uh, Aching. And uh, thank you for all of your efforts. Uh, like uh, you're the maestro behind uh, like keeping all like uh, the um, local actors active in the community. Um, with the four minutes I have, I would like to give Tasha the floor maybe to answer in two minutes, Tasha, the question in the chat regarding uh, uh, like um, uh, about like including more donors. What can we do to include more donors uh, from like other sectors other than the humanitarian uh, sector, so like they can fund multi-year uh, funding. Um, what can we do? What experiences we need? And then maybe for you, Ashing, you can maybe answer the question that is on the uh, on the uh, Q and A. Uh, what uh, can local actors do to strengthen their capacities toward accessing grants uh, for sustainable projects within uh, their domain? Please, uh, the floor is yours, Tasha. Thanks so much, Riyad. And thank you, Acheng, for your intervention. Um, a quick response, because I know we're short on time, regarding engaging different types of donors um, for 
long-term support for the type of work we do. Um, perhaps just two things to say. The first is that the donor community that supports the Alliance does support the vision of the humanitarian development peace nexus, meaning bringing together um, funding streams and actors who deliver humanitarian and development work together. We know that to do effects prevention and response, we need to do that. Um, so there, there are a group of donors who are committed to this. Um, and I think that that group is growing. It's important for us to demonstrate two things. One is the concrete examples of doing that type of work um, and the effectiveness, taking it to scale and how prevention works. Um, and then the other piece is for donors to also enable their different funding streams to be able to um, support long-term multi-year funding. That is a work in progress on both sides. We need to work hand in hand to effectively achieve that. I see progress, but we're not there yet. So thank you all for engaging the diplomatic community in order to do that. Thanks, Riyadh. Thank you very much, Tasha. Nassim, any last words? Yeah, um, I'm Kenyan, so I'll give an example from Kenya. Uh, unfortunately, Kenya and other countries in the region, we are going, we are experiencing a lot of floods. We are losing a lot of uh, many lives. Um, as, as a local actor myself, and what I've seen other Kenyans do, mobilize each other. Um, there are Kenyans who have more resources than others. So um, about this community mobilization and asking those who have extra to, to, to uh, pull the resources together and help. Also from Kenya, we have Kenya Red Cross. Um, it's been known for mobilizing resources locally and investing in non investing in ventures that are not profit making. For example, there is the hotel, the Boma Hotel owned by the Red Cross of Kenya and the money they get from you know, the hotel, it goes back to helping Kenyans that are in need. Uh, going outside Kenya, I would, I would say local actors have strength in numbers. So I would, I would suggest that uh, local actors come together and, and, and forward proposal as groups, not as individuals. And when they do that, I believe they are the donors that uh, would listen to them better than if they are fundraising alone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Achim. And um, like with the last 30 seconds I have, I would like to uh, thank you all for attending today. Uh, thank you for making the time for this important subject. It tells how, uh, like your attendance today tells how much it is important and needed in our sector. Um, and a special thanks for all of our esteemed speakers today. Uh, uh, Hilda, uh, Maria Carolina, Karam, Tasha, and Ashing. Um, with this, uh, we would end the. Um, I would also like to thank the uh, interpreters. They did an amazing work in the uh, back end. Um, thank you, everyone, and I hope we go out of this uh, session today with more determination to work on localization and empowering local actors, especially in the field of child protection. Thank you everyone. And I hope we can meet again in future events.